So when we're talking about kids, adults, uh, teens that are have extremely wild behaviors, uh, so ranging uh, in a broad-minded way between the angry, fighting, pushing people away, causing hell here and there, that one side, which is one side of the dissociative effects of trauma, and on the other side, depressed, suicidal, withdrawn, hanging with the wrong crowd, trying to be as obscure as possible. Those two sides are, are the two sides of of dissociation. Dissociation is the imprint, it's the calling card of trauma. The irony is that although some of these behaviors can seem highly self-destructive or antisocial, get kids into more trouble or drive parents crazy, we actually, through the, a different lens, we see them as, as being uh, defense mechanisms. Because whatever got hurt before memory or an early childhood, things we can't identify because they're held in the unconscious, the psyche is trying to protect from further hurt. So if I have a sense, even unconscious, that you're a threat to me, I'm going to I'm going to be triggered in some kind of complex. I'm going to come out swinging, be antisocial, or I'm going to withdraw and, and fade away and not let you even get close. So that that notion of I have parents come to me with the kids all the time and say, kids acting out in school, fix them. You know, he's just being bad and realize it, at least at first level, that those behaviors are trying to protect, protect something that's been hurt and hurt badly. Now, you can't the, the irony or the, the conundrum of trauma is that. These self-defense mechanisms, which are only are really quite rational to self-protect, those places you go that are safe also become your prison. So if you withdraw enough, you'll find yourself locked in that, in the conundrum. You'll be locked in the prison that trauma can put you in. And so that takes a lot of uh, therapy to get out of that. As I mentioned to you earlier, this for the more extreme cases where there is clearly some, and there's ways to to diagnose this physically, to uh, test the brain, to diagnose the brain in its form of dysregulation. It can be remedied in part with uh, uh, some consistent neurofeedback, which is outlined in, in uh, Basil van der Kolk's book quite well, um, The Body Keeps the Score. So there are sophisticated tools out there that are relegated really to, into the clinical psychology world. They're on the other side from talk therapy, which is what I do. But I've had, I've had clients uh, do this. I've gone through some of this myself. So you can literally get a, a map of the mind, what they call them a mind map, after taking a QEEG, and you can see where the brain waves have been dysregulated, uh, where the brain is either over-functioning or under-functioning, under and through some, in, with the right therapist and the right tools, clinical therapist, you can, you can begin to create re, uh, regulation back into a normal zone of tolerance. And so that doesn't mean that you become you know, uh, inert for everything, but does mean you can experience moments of anxiety or depression and then come back into the normal zone. I've had this with clients. It's been remarkable to see the turnaround, either for really extreme cases or even for just sort of persistent ADHD. So it works in complement with talk therapy. Uh, but what, until you get a brain that's in some form of re-regulation, talk therapy really is very limited in what it can affect to do. Welcome to another episode of Beyond Risk and Back. Thank you so much for joining me, parents, teachers, clinicians. I appreciate you being here. If you do like the show, please head over and leave us a review on Apple iTunes. It really does help parents find this show. I'm speaking today with Stephen Rowley. We are going to discuss trauma. We're going to discuss medication. We're going to discuss mapping the mind and the benefits of understanding what's really going on in the brain. At the beginning of you and I getting ready to go on the air, we talked about meds and you, and you just brought it up again. And one of the things that you mentioned was the short term and the necessity of the short term attitudes and the short term understanding, or at least understanding that these are designed as a short term concept. I think this is another thing that a lot of parents miss. There are some disorders, diseases that require consistent and constant, perhaps lifelong medica medical medication intervention, such as schizophrenia. But by and large, medication is a crutch, is a temporary fix. Can you talk more about that? I probably in my own way of talking wouldn't call it as a crutch unless somebody becomes really dependent on a drug. The, as you, we, we talked earlier, we have to make some distinction. These meds on, on the extreme level, people who are, say, uh, fighting a bipolar, lithium is not a, quote, drug. It's a assault, and it's a lifelong proposition, and it has some side effects. Not, But it, what people complain that they had a great time when they were on the manic side, and now, you know, they don't, now they're brought to more of a neutral state, and they kind of miss the old crazy part of themselves. 
but but antidepressants generally have uh, as a rule tend to have a half life of about six weeks, which means it takes six weeks to have the full effect and six weeks to to wean off. That's a, that's a fairly long time. But uh, uh, anti anxiety meds, uh, ADH meds, half life of about a day, day and a half. So they're in and out of your system just a, just a tad longer than saying taking ibuprofen. So so in the short run, for some people who suffer mightily with ADHD, those meds become lifesavers because they reduce that capacity to be of, of hyper arousal and have themselves all over the map. Uh, now, one could argue whether you take it for for years and years, whether you're addicted or not. But for some people, find it lifesaving. For others, it's like, you know, it, it is it does become a uh, a poor substitute for something deeper to, in terms of lifestyle changes, or as we mentioned, some other kinds of therapies that are available. But but let's not kid ourselves. They have short term effects. We can debate forever for some people whether that's good or maybe not so good. But I think I I was probably more doctrinaire before. There's that great uh, YouTube by Sir Ken Robinson about the educational system and ADHD. I mean, he's talking about the rampant use of of ADHD meds, and I got right back to this to the issue of of doctors. Overprescribing meds for the third, thir- the classic boy, third, third grade boy. Mom comes in, pulling his ear, saying the kid's driving me crazy. He's he's misbehaving at school. He's a big pain in the ass. Give him some meds. They do, and then happy day. And they do that again and again. And uh, never, to, never to think, however, that um, the school isn't right for the kid. He's uh, he's misbehaving for because of schooling. And for that matter, we also have to say, in honesty, to parents. That sometimes kids are reacting to their parental environment, to their own parents. Or to trauma. I think this is one of the things that has been frustrating to see over the years. My listeners understand, I am not against meds. I I think Ritalin got me through high school. You know, I I really do. I don't think I would have made it without it. Uh, And I hated every moment of the idea that I had to be normal or equal in some state of equilibrium with a pill. And people with bipolar, schizophrenia, as you say, these are lifelong maintenance things. And when we are dealing with a industry that will not take a beat, I think is the right concept to actually say, wait a second, is this bipolar or is this PTSD? Wait a second, is this ADHD or is the kid just bored of of school and needs a different learning environment? And can the family facilitate a different environment? There's so many things in play. So give us some of your gold nuggets around the consideration of meds or the consideration of ending meds. What are what are some of the things we need to look at? Well, I think one could be very practical in if whether it's yourself or a child in the family, and if if for example they're suffering some form of hyperarousal, ADHD, uh, um, OCD, things like that, try it for a while. Give it, give it, give it eight weeks and see what the results are. Look for the side effects. Is there is there a calming? Not a calming, but a more emotional regulation. Even for people who don't have these things, how many people who will have a cup of coffee or two in the morning, and like me, have a cup and write really well for the next couple of hours? That, or conversely, some people have a cup of coffee before they go to bed, which I can't imagine. But we can notice some of those things. There, there are those effects that actually are. They can switch moods, switch our energetic, uh, the regulations with it. Sometimes can be really quite powerful and positive. So I think you have to be approach these things with a with a uh, with an open mind. And like I say, for there are for any medication, there's always side effects, and not every medication uh, works the same for everybody else. So that's why there are right now the the, the big pharma is, has a, I think roughly ten or twelve different antidepressants out there. And frankly, despite all the language and some of the chemical differences, it really comes down with a skilled psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse to find the one that works for you. It's not that one is better in general for everybody. It's which one of these seems to work. I had this with a 17-year-old client of mine. She switched meds and she's she, uh, who are antidepressant. She was not doing so well. And suddenly with this one, everything clicked. And she's just doing so incredibly well. And uh, do I think that's all the meds? No. Uh, do I think some of it's the therapy? I'd like to think so. So I think being, being uh, shedding doctrinaire thinking and the orthodoxy, either yes or no, uh, and into a more practical approach, I think. And if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. If, if, if the side effects, like not being able to sleep, for example, or being quick to anger, as an example, if that price is too high to pay, then don't do it. 
you know, and do other things that that, that Vandercoke book mentions a number of things that can be done even for younger people. Somatic work, for sure, um, you know, exercise, diet, exercise in particular. I mean, competitive sports, really good for helping self-regulate. And for some people, and I also mentioned, too, there's a, another bright side to ADHD. Some study years ago, I don't know where it came from, but it, it, seemed, it seems to make sense that in, that in the small business world, that there are a high number, high proportion of small business owners are ADHD. That they have that this this uh, what I call multitasking, which I'm quite good at. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's that's part of that's part of some other kind of little uh, hyper arousal state in me. That actually it, it works really well. I can do five things at one time. I've got a pile of books over. I can test the fact I'm reading nine at the same time. <laughs> I just literally came to this show coming off an ADHD summit for entrepreneurs called the ADHD Toolbox put on okay. by Brainworks. Oh, yeah. And there are 380 people on there that I'm screaming and yelling and they're writing and listening to music and listening to the you know the summit and watching TV and what their kids all at the same time. And work was getting done. It's It's... It's a wonderful thing. You brought up this mind mapping and defense mechanisms. When we were running the treatment facility and we were bringing in mind mapping experts, we would allow the kids to see the printouts of what their minds looked like as they were struggling, as they were suffering, you know, and as, as the kids are coming in. And then they were allowed to see what it looked like when they were ready to graduate. And it locked in the idea, not only for the client, but from the parents. And I have to ask, Stephen, why don't clinics and therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists and doctors, and why are we just throwing medications at these children? Why are we not mapping this mind first? It's, if you go to the doctor and your arm hurts, they x-ray it. Why aren't we doing that with brains? One of the answers is that the tools available are done on a one-to-one -one basis. They've not been able to build at scale where you can get a lot of people. Also, in the, in the world of clinical psychology, as well as my area of psychotherapy, uh, there's large segments of, of those populations are very devoted strictly to cognitive behavioral therapy, behavioral orientations. We see a bad behavior. We want to correct the bad behavior. We don't go in either psychologically or into the kind of complex the neuroscience that you're referring to. I think it's how long does it take the world to catch up? I mean, the, the various professions, I really don't have an answer to that. But I think some of it is uh, we're so spoon-fed in our schools of, of psychotherapy or even medicine. Most regular MDs do not have a particular good grasp of ADHD, nor do they have the tools to do better diagnosis. So we're talking about, you know, in, in med school, and I'm saying I come from a medical family, I can say this, as well, you know, as well as the schools where I've either been a professor or been a, a student, Little mention is made to this. I mean, some of this is still relatively new. I and mean, there are places that say, well, I mentioned uh, UCLA and uh, Dan Siegel. I mean, there have got people who are really prolific in terms of the writing, but you're right. It just has not caught on. There are other niches that have their own specialties. Uh, my area of, of Jungian-based depth psychology fully could be explained through the lens of neuroscience, but those worlds don't want to meet somehow. There's too much orthodoxy in our world and, and including the professions. So it's kind of a long answer, but sometimes it's the bureaucratic institutionalization of, of how knowledge is and skills are imparted. And I want to go back to your point about seeing these when you have uh, young people look or any age for that matter. For clients, I know it can sometimes be an enormous relief to say, you mean I'm not really crazy after all? It's like, no, we're, we're talking about, you know, the psychological stuff. It's important. But if the cause of it is not psychology, we're not going to treat it through talk therapy. Some of the more extreme cases have other other means. But then we're talking about, you know, to get a diagnosis using a QEG is probably um, 1500 and get a new reading is another couple hundred dollars. And then you set course on neurofeedback. And if you get, say, two treatments a week for eight weeks at 150 a pop, I mean, it's for a lot of people, but it's expensive. It's out of, out of reach. I, I do want to say one thing, though, with that, though. I think in terms of the pitch to parents, if you had a kid who was, young person who's, who had been mangled in a car wreck or was suffering with cancer, $5,000, are you kidding, to get this kid, I mean, with the meds or whatever. So, But I think a lot of this is there's, there's a distrust because, and rightfully so, because uh, uh, these the QEG and some of these other tools can actually map the mind. Daniel Amon's clinics have another uh, way of doing this. It's one of the few places where you actually can look inside the mind. You can find where it is. You can see it. 
as opposed to other fields. You come in with a broken shoulder, you get an MRI, you get an X-ray. It's it's second. It's a matter of course. In psychology, it seems almost to be antithetical to want to use some kind of tool that would look inside the brain as though somehow that isn't some sort of a, a teller for how the mind and, and psyche are actually working. This is something that has been addressed on this show a few times where we're actually having to convince the parents that to have a conversation around willingness versus capability, you know, my child's depressed and they just need to get out of bed and they just need to, and they just need to, you know, they're, they're dealing with anxiety, but they just got to face it. They got to be willing to be uncomfortable. And that's insinuating that your child's not willing to do these things in the same sense as we understand addiction. That this isn't about a willingness to quit. This is about a capability. And when we bring up the concept of capability, we are now talking about brain chemistry. We are not talking about emotions. And that's why it seems that the emotional talk therapy doesn't seem to reach things like depression, anxiety, addiction, self-harm, because we're actually talking about brain deficiencies that's causing behavioral dysfunctions. It's a bit of a bell curve in terms of where what works and for whom. And I mean, I still depression, anxiety can still be worked with in psychotherapy. And these issues about the splintering of the self, you don't necessarily always have to go into neuroscience or into biofeedback to get those. But for the more extreme cases, I think there's more hope there. But your point is really well taken because I know what parents have a end up finding they're on the short end of, a, of their own fuse with their kids and it comes down to you're just too lazy or whatever. It's the same argument that comes up in talking about uh, drug addicts or particularly alcoholics, you know, seeing it through the lens of willpower. You don't have enough willpower. And we just know that we know that doesn't that's not the case. It's not a matter of willpower or for that matter, weight issues. I mean, people who have who struggle with obesity, it's not just a matter of willpower. There's something else going on there. And there, there are innovations out there, but I'm like you, it's frustrating to see how slowly this takes place, but really within a, my own profession, even within the circles that are I'm attuned with in terms of Jungian work or depth psychology, but you bring up neuroscience and they all kind of look, you know, what are you talking about? Or, or oh, that's nice, good for you. And uh, so I don't know how, I think schools, the schools themselves owe it to me to build some of this into curriculum as people are being trained. But we're, I know we're a far, far cry from that. Hey folks, I want to share with you a product I've been trying out lately. Uh, it's called Magic Mind. It's a natural nootropic drink that helps with focus. I've been trying it alongside my morning coffee. Uh, it has cut down on my caffeine consumption and I really do stay more focused and get a lot more done during the day. So if you're looking for a new drink to try out, I would recommend it. It's extremely healthy. It's filled with the, all the kinds of stuff you want, you and your kids. It's also available at Sprouts. Uh, check it out. Get it on Amazon. It's an amazing product. And big thanks to Magic Mind for being our first sponsor. It feels like the conversation we have with medical doctors around nutrition. My wife and I have a, a very dark memory of our treatment center sending a girl to an acute unit on a suicide watch. And we sent very clear documentation letters, letters from our therapist, warning their team to not put this girl on an SSRI because when we did her geomine, she was already overproducing serotonin. And they blew us off, put her on an SSRI, and she had a psychotic break. Now, what, does that mean we were right and they were wrong? And at this point, the frustration is in the way of actually justifying anybody's. Again, I felt like we're throwing seeds in the desert and hoping something takes root. Let's now move to the parents who are often on the receiving end of a therapeutic team that, again, as you were saying and demonstrated, kind of rolls her eyes and looks around going, I don't know what you mean, QEEG. Like, what are you talking about? You know, your insurance isn't going to pay for that stuff. Therefore, how do we move parents into understanding what psychotherapy and psychology is trying to do with medications, even if they don't understand what's going on with, with the current brain dynamic? Well, you can approach that on kind of an intellectual or cognitive level and have do psychoeducation and handouts or talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. That has that has some value to it. But I think where parents find 
the toughest part where they're in the face to face and they're here now with a rebellious kid or one who just ran out the door, or locked, the, ran out of the house or took the car or locked themselves in. You don't know whether they have pills or whatever. There's a bit of what I would call almost a necessary sur- surrender to the place of calling. I don't know what to do next. It's like in therapy itself. When I get clients who kind of or myself kind of go, I really don't know. This place of I don't know, it pushes. And I think I'm saying this now as, as a parent more than anything, that whatever is going on with your kid, you don't know. Oftentimes, therapists don't really know. We don't. We can't be inside the psyche to, to really know. But I think that that calls forth and simple mind as it sounds is to have is to fall. Your fallback is in fact unconditional love. To hold this wild energy, to hold this crazy stuff, and of course, assure personal safety. But to not feel pressed to have answers or have smart moves to that you're going to out somehow fix your kid, which you'd love to do to get him out of their suffering. Because you don't have the skill or the ability. And, and to understand those limits, I think, pushes us back into kind of a form of patience while our children, what we hope will be a phase and not something permanent. Uh, we just, I had a friend who, who um, lost her um, 23-year-old son just a couple of weeks ago uh, who I think fought psychosis. I mean, when you're up against something that bad, I don't care, even with doctors, even with medication, I don't know the, the, the real history, you're up against impossible odds it, you're up you're up against things that sometimes we can't really reach and we have to kind of accept our limits with that i don't mean to say, sound defeatist but uh if you've seen the book the, the movie uh, the buck about buck branham the original horse whisperer the, one of the lessons in there of course is that how much the value of book, <laughs> training the parents not, or training the owners not the horses but in that particular case in that movie there is the one horse and the one owner they can't fix I think uh, I'm only guessing for my friend uh, that uh, the frustration and sorrow, bit not being able to, she or the family or the doctors involved, to really reach this kid far enough to prevent suicide. And sometimes, sometimes it happens. And sometimes there's an enormous grief we have to confront ourselves when we just hit the limits. Let's talk about this necessary surrender. This, you know, you hit the point where. You've tried the meds, you've tried the therapy, you've had the help, maybe you've done a treatment center, it didn't stick, they're back to it, and you hit necessary surrender point, you're not suggesting that they're just shoulders up and palms up going, I don't know, and that that's it. This kind of surrender, I, I saw it on a spiritual level, it really is kind of, not defaulting, but falling back into creating a non-judgmental space about the kid, despite the evidence of bad behavior that seems like it's hard to say you're going to be not judgmental if your kid got picked up for drunk driving. You're going to have, you need to be parenting too. It doesn't mean you can't be without that. But to accept the fact that whatever is going on within that kid, whether you, for reasons you can't understand or might go back in utero experience, how do you know? How do we know what, or an adopted child, how do we know what happened in the first six months? We really don't. And sometimes that works out fine in a case like me. Other times, we just don't know. So in that just don't know space and therapy uh, sometimes can be holding that not knowing space, hanging with that kid and the prerequisite for that, or maybe the next move would be a better way to put it, is the listening. Is the, a routine, not only listening, but also to the degree you can uh, encourage a kid, young person to begin to tell their story, their side of what's going on. I blew up because of this. I got mad at someone, so I wrecked the car when I was doing this. And it's hard for a parent to hear that stuff and not have a reaction to keep their mouths zipped up. But but when that kind of, uh, this is, comes right out of a book by Judith Herman on, on trauma and recovery, creating safety, number one, and I think that's done by by listening. And then as we begin to retrieve some of the, the, the story, the memories, that telling and the retelling of their own story, which sometimes happens in therapy, can have a slow but uh, positive effect over time. But it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience and not all. Parents say, if you tell me to listen, I've already been around the block a hundred times with this kid. I'm ready to go nuts myself. It's a difficult challenge to be sure. But it's, it's, just, it's no different. Well, Carl Jung himself was one of the, in his early correspondence with Bill A, was one of the under, you know, founders of AA. And that surrender to a higher power doesn't necessarily mean religious, but to surrender to something else that's beyond your control for those who believe in, in AA. Is the key. Based on that correspondence, there's a wonderful book called Addiction and the War of the Gods. It's, it's fascinating. Again, with people like you who are, excuse me for saying, symbology nerds, but also just the idea that we are dealing with 
and and they, that that book focuses on addiction, but we are dealing with if there is ever something that can be regarded as the devil, it's something as devious as addiction, mental health, self harm. How could a human being do these things? Uh, at least in my world, it, it comes up a lot, and that's the phrase in a book by Thomas More, written by the same name, "The Dark Night of the Soul." When you're with a kid going through whatever they're going through, if you just say you're screwed up and we got to get you fixed, the message is you're screwed up. <laughs> There's something wrong with you and we have to fix you. And of course, people don't like to hear that and they don't want to get fixed. Stay away from it. But this goes for younger people too, as well as for, for older adults. If you can kind of locate with the client, with the child, kind of where they are, their sense of lo lostness of not knowing which end is up. They, they know what, what, what their lives used to be better and they have no idea if they're ever going to get to a world that's going to be happier for them. If you've been there and done that some yourself and you can provide as a guide the handholds for them to have patience and some kind of a inner knowing that they can endure and get through this phase of their life, it gives a sense that you're in transition. And if we're, if they're, good therapists can actually use some of the negativity to find those seeds of uh, optimism and potential growth for them. There's that wonderful uh, poem by David White called The Well of Grief. It talks about going into the deep ooze, into, into a bottom of the well where coins have been thrown. And, the, and the, what it conjures is an image of going down so dark, so deep, so cold, so slimy, reaching into that stuff. And I've heard other people say what addiction is, is going in, holding on, and getting stuck. Whereas... Others who can go in and have enough patience to stay with it, find those coins, find those gems, pull them out, and those become the seeds of some other self-learning, some other seeds for your own. Now, I know this sounds very intellectualized and airy-fairy, but it's really, it actually is quite not when we can find something in the middle of all this chaos and darkness is actually, it has some kind of counterintuitive sense to it. And so good therapy can help identify that, help find that, uh, help give the, the kid or the client some sense of there is some reason to be optimistic, even though your mom and dad are breathing down your throat and doctors are telling you you're screwed up and trying to feed you meds all the time. There is something really more powerful inside you. But that, that, that's, you know, like any kind of growth, it's a cultivation. I just, it was what I just read the other day about uh, who was it, uh, talked about if we can just find that one blade of grass that can push up through slabs of concrete, that's all we need is that one little ray of hope or sunshine. And I, I actually, I think that's why good therapy and good ther good parenting under the right conditions can find that, can find that something and hold on to it as a, as an anchor, while everything while the rest of the world's going to <laughs> going to hell and out of the basket. You've got that one thing that you and somebody else sees in you. There's that uh, great line from Orwell: uh, "Perhaps better to be seen than loved." And this is, I think, what is so critical in working with children, our own. Uh, and uh, with therapy is is to see to see them, not like we're going to turn the love meter on and off, but actually see what they're about, see what suffering they're in, and see what other talent that they still have resident in them. It's a and and to be heard. I mean, when you're when you're being heard, you're being seen. Listen, Stephen, I don't think I could do justice to my listeners if I did not take a moment with someone steeped in Jungian psychotherapy and understanding the Jungian concepts and not talk about dreams. If nothing else than to just allow the parents a breath away from the seriousness of, of what we've got going on. Being a symbols nerd as, as I am, the book that I have that's out about it, I want to discuss dreams. So please start with a basic, give us the basic 101 primer on the idea that Jung had around dreams and what they mean to the individual? Well, let me just say for the people who like to read books, I was just re-listening re after some time, Robert Johnson's book called The Inner, Inner Work. And he does a marvelous recitation of, of dreams, dream work, its relationship to Jung, and I can't uh, outdo him, that's for sure. But I would say that, you know, in a, on a very more simple way, those of us who can remember dreams, parts of dreams, even a single image, or even a, 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 a distinct feeling that comes from it, a feeling tone out of a dream. I mean, any of those can be worked with. It doesn't always have to be dream symbol. But 
what we have to understand is that coded language, that symbolic language is coming to us in a way that's basically trying to tell us something we don't know. Now, we can go on and on about symbols and archetypal symbols. And there's some people who keep a, uh, a couple books about every symbol that comes up in a dream. And I, I do that sometimes, including in, indigenous uh, uh, animal uh, symbols and so forth. Then there's the other side of it uh, in my world uh, uh, called dream tending, which is a little bit different process where we really kind of work the dream, uh, its location, the imagery that's there, what it, how we associate with that, how I as a therapist, dream therapist, also associate with those dreams. It's much more interactive. Sometimes formal dream analysis is a little bit more like formal intellectual interpretation versus playing jazz. I mean, you can look at it from both both angles. But back to your point, the dream is is the language of the soul. It's the language of the psyche. And Johnson's point is that it's not really that as coded or mysterious as we think that it is. Although clearly there are some dreams that take a while to fully understand, and that feeling can change. James Hillman talked about the one of the, the worst problems in dream analysis is if you have he uses an example in one of his books about if you have a dream of a snake. And you say, oh, that snake's my mother, or that snake is my boss, or whatever. As soon as you put a label to it, you concretize it. And when you concretize it, it, it goes dead. So one of the values of dreams, particularly those that seem to slip through our fingers uh, in the next morning, if we remember the image, is to let the image stay, let the image work on us. And we come back again and again to that, to that image. In my book, I talk about a, a dream I had, I think came from the Dalai Lama after hearing him talk in a, in a private session down in Pasadena several years ago. And that dream of him dressed like as an EMT in purple and gold uniform and handing me a, 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 a baby-like figure wrapped in his his, uh, his uh, uniform, handing it to me and then putting his hands on top of my head, an explosion of golden light, utter, it's like unbelievable. I mean, that obviously that dream, that you don't forget something like that. I had other people there who knew him and said, that's the way he works, stupid. That's, <laughs> he came to you, you didn't. But anyway, that, that's a more extraordinary. But and for other people who have recurrent dreams or motifs, I'm in a large house. For me, it's a golf. It's, it's uh, golf courses. I dream about golf courses all the time, and I have a, my own interpretation. I have a red bicycle in a lot of dreams that come back to me. So those kind of mysteries, those kind of images, we we are well to do to hold on to. I think that's why uh, I was just at, we're, my wife and I were just in New York and we're, we're at the uh, we're at MoMA, and uh, you look at some of the great great paintings of all time, even including those, you know, like Pollock, or where they're, it's just abstract. Those images just get in your soul. They get in your psyche. You can't let go of them. Or Rothko. I mean, there's no, that's not a, a typical image. I mean, it is an image of blocks of color, but there's something about the color. And there are books that talk about dream color uh, and uh, and shape. And what that does, what that's, what, what I'm taking in, what that's that I think is is a is an art form and one that that uh, we would do well without having too much of a literal interpretation. Oh, this is my mother, you know, you know, yapping at me again, or this is my old man's on a drunk again, and I, I'm I'm caught and I can't get away from it, and that kind of thing. Sometimes that can be right, but a lot of times it's something more. It's usually not, you know. So if somebody says, "I've had these dreams," like a, you know, like I had an argument one day with somebody. You know, one evening and the next night I have a dream of being in an argument with that person. Is that dream about that person? Could be. Seems logical. But then you kind of, that's where the Jungian concept comes in, where these dream symbols come from, where these archetypal forms come from. And Jung and many others, of course, starting with Jung, saw these this array of symbols as part of the collective, part of the collective unconscious. And Campbell's work, why certain uh, image motifs, sculptures, and other things seem to be universal across continents, same periods of time where, say, what we consider Christian iconography was occurring in in Asia at the same time. Nobody took a boat and flew over there. So that we're tapping into something, into the collective. Uh, I dare say with pandemic and politics and all the wars going on, that's pretty easy to figure out if we're having dreams of, the violence or, or monsters or whatever. It could be, we don't know, it, it wouldn't be unlikely to say that we're picking that up in the unconscious. So that, but that to me, in terms of uh, therapy, uh, both both uh, what Johnson talks about as uh, the value of dreams, but also active imagination, writing, 
doing your own artwork, uh, uh, Jungian uh, sand tray work. They all deal with images. And, and so in sand tray, as an example, even with the littlest kids, they can't really do talk therapy about what's going on. But when they do get in the sand and put those figures out there in certain combinations, it speaks volumes. It is like dream interpretation to look at these and take, I take a picture of them and so forth. Then you see boldly, psyche speaking, when you've got a four-year-old who you know has been tra sexually traumatized, can't talk about it, claims he you know, doesn't really remember. When you see, I remember, you see, I remember going to a training here in Seattle with a really well-known therapist. She showed pictures that she took of sand tray of a, of, a, of a young woman, and she said it took me six months to realize I was watching rape. Now, when you look at the picture, you kind of go, well, but of course, it looks, like it, it, it seems utterly obvious. But at the time, you know, she's going through, those symbols just didn't quite click. They didn't quite hit. But Psyche was saying, yes, this is what happened. So that's what makes it so fascinating. So when we introduce, as I do with clients, we're kind of like a, a, a iceberg. You know, you and I are talking on the tip of the iceberg right now. And below us is the other 90% uh, that is uh, uh, part of the, both the fun and the mystery of working on this level, whether it's through dreams or other vehicles where part of our own consciousness, part of our own healing comes from helping redigest and to the degree possible, allow uh, some of this material to come up and uh, bring to consciousness. I think that in part is part of the issue of being able to name what's really going going on. That was the whole issue with Jung and his uh, attention to the opposites, with things that, you know, I hate my old man, he's a rotten SOB, but you know, he was a pretty good guy after he came all of my games, right? So clients come in often wondering why they have anxiety because they've actually somehow, almost unconsciously, chosen one version over the other one, okay? He really was a pretty good guy, my old man, when in fact all this hatred and the abuse they suffered at their hands is still hidden back there. So to be able to bring up both and to ask for almost as, mu as much as we can to let both be true and to hold both of those is true. It seems contradictory. How can they both be true? Good guy, bad guy, how can they be true? And that's why I think the magic of psyche is that in some time, in some way, that resolution, what Jung called the transcendent third, will emerge. But it's not something, the irony is it's not something you can get. It's something that will come to you. And that's part of the patience and kind of the, kind of keeping your feelers about, you know, how and when and why will some resolution come my way? I do this a couple of times in my own book, and it, by quite extraordinary means, I think, in terms of what happened to me. But uh, but that's that kind of, uh, we introduced it in the world of dreams and the things, some of the union concepts, is to, is to, uh, uh, enter into the, uh, to leave rational thought behind and, and, and join with intuition, uh, join with other ways of knowing. Sometimes these can be tradition, indigenous traditions, or for some people it's plant medicine and so forth. Whatever creates these numinous experiences in us begins to say we're more than just what we think we are, tiny little rational human beings walking around when in fact we're all lugging stuff, we're all lugging stuff from the past. You mentioned one of your own instances. You're lugging some of that stuff from your past. I've got my own stuff too. We all do. We all have a shadow side. But if we don't recognize we have a shadow side, we're lost. And if we don't, for example, in, in contemporary politics, if we don't realize the stuff that we see that is making us nauseous to look on the news every day, that's us. That's not just this political figure or that or that army or that head of state. Joseph Campbell talked about the well of grief a little bit differently. Joseph Campbell was saying that when your brain, your prefrontal cortex, the king and the queen, are finally in an activated space where they can hire that warrior to climb the mountain and then go inside the cave to battle that dragon, the shadow, and rescue the princess, the future. What else do they find in the cave? Well, that's the gold. That's where the dragons put our gold. And that's that's that that thing that's in that dark space that's in that that shadow realm and and it's not a story about a man rescuing a woman from a monster it's a story about our prefrontal cortex coming back online in the face of the shadow and finding courage and finding valor and finding virtue to rescue our future once innocent now not grown not innocent anymore the princess is no longer innocent now she's ready to be queen because she's seen the darkness 
This is where this sitting in the darkness comes from that Stephen was talking about being able to sit with your child while they are saying something completely inane and ridiculous, but you're just listening. You're not judging. You're not responding. You're not trying to come up with what's wrong with what they just said. You're just listening. And you know what? To do this is easier said than done, especially when we're fear parenting, fury parenting, or fatigue parenting. So this, as always, my dear parents and listeners, brings us to you take care of yourselves first. You take care of those adult supportive relationships second, and you take care of your children third, because that's how we find ourselves able to sit in the darkness and listen. I want you to make sure that you go to stephenrowley108.com, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-R-O-W-L-E-Y, 108.com and follow up with Stephen, find out more of what he's doing there and make sure you check out what what he's got there. The, the website is packed with information for you. Big thanks as always to Deepin Productions for helping me produce and distribute this episode and making it sound good. And I'll see you next time on Beyond Risk and Back. <laughs>